What's up, everybody? This is Eustace Mullins, and if you've never heard of him, that's a shame. Because him and Walter Veith are responsible for 90, at least 90% of everything we know about these incognito societies, let's say. And the factions that are pulling the strings behind the curtain. So if you ever want to go to the source of knowledge I see a lot of people speculate about, look into Eustace Mullins. He was writing books about all this stuff 30 years before the internet. He wrote this book, Curse of Canaan, back in the 80s. And he goes into exact detail about who in the royal families married into who and a real history of conquest throughout the last four or 500 years. But he tracks this predator class all the way back to Noah's Ark. Doesn't that suck when you watch the whole world of wicked people just to have more wicked people? <laughs> So there's this weird story of Noah after the ark and his son Ham, quote, seeing his nakedness while Noah was passed out drunk on wine. This earns a curse from Noah, and it's kind of like, well, he saw him naked. What's the big deal? So people have speculated there might have been more to it. But he doesn't curse Ham, his son who saw him naked. He curses his grandson, Canaan. Officially, nobody knows why. But Noah had two other sons, Japheth and Shem. And this is what Mullins writes about all this. In order to understand why the name of Shem was systematically reviled and concealed throughout the records of history, we must return the record to his thoroughly degenerate and evil nephew, Canaan. Canaan was so wicked, his last will and testament to his children was a formula for vice. It read, Love one another that is, of this tribe only, love robbery, love lewdness, loathe your masters, and do not speak truth. This, Mullen says, comes from the Babylonian holy book. And basically, that all things good come from Shem, all things bad come from Canaan. So this is an age-old struggle between people who just want to live their lives and people who want to take everything from them. But we're going to skip forward a few thousand years. Now you know what he means when he says Canaanites. The Canaanites, or Phoenicians, employed their command of various monopolies to gain control of the commerce of the entire Mediterranean area. The most centrally located headquarters for all their operations was located on the Adriatic Sea, so here they founded the city of Venice, or Phoenicia. And I agree 100%. Uh, officially... The Venetians of the Middle Ages aren't supposed to have anything to do with the ancient Phoenicians, even though all kinds of words from different languages are just off by one letter, you know, trade a B for a T, V for an F. But the Phoenicians were the merchants that controlled all shipping and trade in the ancient days, known for their shipbuilders and sailing vessels. Then a couple thousand years go by, and the Venetian Navy is the premier navy of the Mediterranean. But no, they, they have nothing at all to do with each other. Okay. The Venetians were known as masters of intrigue. They aided the Turks in the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, which was where the ruling class fled to after the fall of Rome. And they say lived there for an uneventful thousand years. Keep getting these phantom thousand years. But the Turks were shocked at the rapacity of the Venetians who carried off much of the city's legendary art, treasures, gold, and jewelry. Most of the time when ancient cities were sacked, you paid up a ransom and then they went home and you had to pay tribute. I've been looking for this picture for quite a while, so I got to share it here. Uh, this is the sack of Rome. You guys notice anything distinctly medieval about their dress? That's supposed to be 400 AD, this as well. He continues, Venice had now become the headquarters of a ruthless social climbing band of entrepreneurs who purchased titles for themselves or created them out of thin air, built splendid mansions, and collected the art treasures of Europe. They financed their new lifestyle with the enormous sums which they garnered from trade, piracy, and money lending. This group became known throughout Europe as the Black Nobility because they were of Canaanite origin. The Black Nobility gradually infiltrated the noble families of Europe. Today, they constitute most of the surviving European royalty. History is told by the victors, so most anything you look up on this will shine them in a positive light. 
just like the Knights Templar, who appear to be the main banking syndicate before the 1300s catastrophes. Because of their ruthlessness, the Venetians attained a worldwide reputation as international arbiters of intrigue, revolution, poisoning, and other forms of assassination. They often conspired to bankrupt any opponent, which is the same concept today of market share, which just means that you have a certain market cornered, and that's what they've done with every industry. The Venetians were known to cruelly, uh, yeah, the daughters of anyone in the oligarchy who dared to oppose them. They still use these intimacy rituals, and sometimes they film them, and sometimes they lose 50 hard drives and DVDs of it. But they rapidly spread northward, setting up businesses and banking establishments in the northern cities of Italy. They bought more titles and intermarried with impoverished families of the old nobility. It's easy to look up the family tree of the blue bloodlines of Europe. And this looks like a whole lot of people, but we're talking less than 100 people over the course of 400 years. And they have definitely fashioned the modern world according to their ancient oaths. In Florence, the preeminent family was the de Micis, who used their wealth to establish an academia which foisted humanism on the world. The de Mici established Florence as the European center of the B nobility, also establishing close ties with the ruling families of England through the Savoy and Esta families. Strangely absent in Mullen's writing is the ties that all of these families had with the Holy Roman Empire and Church of Rome. Here you can see four popes that are of the Medici bloodline, but they financed and had plenty of other holy fathers in their pocket, like Baldassar Cosa, who was a pirate, but the Medicis financially backed him, got him elected as Popa. But of course, history is always favorable to these people because they wrote the histories. Yeah, he was a pirate, but he was only following in his brother's footsteps. But the Medicis financed the Renaissance, rewrote history. I did a video about this a little while back. On the left, you have Cosimo de' Medici on his donkey. He is the original godfather. He invented the whole system of ruling from the shadows because then when the heat comes down, it comes down on your puppet. Now, everybody's heard about the amazing artwork and artists of the Renaissance, but this was a reinvention of society. Renaissance, and I know some will argue this, means a rebirth. Not talked about quite as much as the revolution of thought that was occurring. Not only did they control the Church of Rome, but they controlled the opposition, the humanist movement, through the Platonic Academy. Just by sheer coincidence, a man named Gemesto Plathon discovered the writings of an ancient thinker called Plato. Plathon, 1300s. Plato, 300 BC. And you would think that he discovered these ancient writings in Old Latin, but no, the guy on the right, whose name I forget, transcribed all of these ancient writings into Latin. Not from Latin. He changed. The, he wrote them into Latin. This ancient Plato just happened to write a book about a utopian republic of a society that was ran by a strictly secular governance. Which, to the outward-facing side of the Church of Rome, this would have been a heresy of thought. So what better way to disguise your heresies than to say, no, this was written by a guy a thousand years ago. Anyway, our whole idea of the ancients comes from Florence in the 1300s. Official history records this as being the time of the Black D. I've done many videos showing how there was much more than just a bug going around at that time. But no matter how you cut it, two-thirds of the world exited life and whole cities were up for grabs. Enter the Black Nobility. Once you understand that the Earth shift happened at that time, then history actually makes a lot of sense. A perfect example is the Santa Maria del Fiore. They say they started building this, and then they got up to the dome, and, well, all of a sudden nobody knew how to put a dome on top of this. And it sat like this for 80 years until Felipe Brunelleschi came along. Now, do you really think when they started this that they had no idea how they were going to finish it? I don't. I think that the people capable of doing this all got wiped out. Officially, the Pantheon in Rome was built in 125 AD. Not too shabby for a 2,000-year-old building. And then Europe fell into the Dark Ages for a 1,000 years where they didn't write anything down, they didn't build any amazing structures, 
and to break their architectural fast, instead of starting off with a rather simple basilica or something, no, they go for the Santa Maria del Flor, which the dome is, I believe, five meters larger than the Pantheon. If you take out that thousand years, then you have the people of Florence trying to one-up the people of Rome for the biggest, fanciest church of them all. Here's Rome, 125 AD, and here's Florence, 1300 AD, with hardly anything to show for the intervening years. And then there's this painting with all the medieval garb of the sack of Rome in 410 AD. I didn't really intend to go so hard on the timelines in this video, but that's where it went. And we're really just scratching the surface of this so-called nobility. The truth is seldom complicated. He who controls international trade is at the top of the food chain. The Roman navy controlled trade throughout the Mediterranean. They fell, and strangely enough, nobody reestablished these trade lines for a thousand years, or wrote any books, or built any impressive structures. There's a saying that power abhors a vacuum, meaning if there's an empty space there at the top, somebody's going to fill it, but that didn't happen for a thousand years. And then in the 1300s or so, the Venetians all of a sudden were excellent sailors and seamen, reestablished these trade routes. They colluded with their enemies, the Turks, to topple Constantinople because they wanted to topple the competition that was within their own ranks. Now, the Venetians only controlled trade in the Mediterranean, while the Turks to the east controlled all of the international trade between the east and the west. This is why they're still bitter rivals today, and there's one group you've all heard of that gained their wealth because they controlled the routes along the Silk Road. I used to think that people were fundamentally the same and shared the same core values, but I don't anymore. I've worked for some of these ultra-rich people out in California that just seem to be of different stock. What we're seeing today is the culmination of many, many years of conquest by a people that really do seem to have the goal of destroying every last vestige of free civil society. Just 20 years ago, it seemed like they were content to just rule over a civilized society, while now they seem bent on bringing it to ashes. But at least one part of this is fairly simple. Who controls the trade routes controls the nations. Static out.